let's be honest here. You know, accountability is a huge piece of culture. It's a huge piece of a behavior that you want all of your uh, people that are involved in your program to embrace. You know, we're going to hold ourselves accountable in everything that we do. We're going to hold our teammates accountable. And so when you model that, when you set that example, you send a message, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to admit you made a mistake. It's okay to accept responsibility. And as the leader, when you do that, now that behavior is reinforced with everyone. So it's huge. And I, I can't think of anything other, well, I just really can't think of anything that, that helps build trust and helps build that connection more than holding yourself accountable and being vulnerable with each other. I'm going to let my guard down and say, yeah, I made a mistake. I messed up. It's my bad, my fault. You know, I know I can do better. Welcome to the Coaches Club Podcast, powered by Transform Sport, where we believe great coaches transform lives, athletes deserve great coaches, and coaches deserve great training. I'm your host, Luke Gromer, and every week we're bringing you conversations with coaches and leaders in sport that will help you grow as an effective teacher and transformational leader so that you and your team can reach your potential. Coaches, I'm excited to welcome Coach Lynn Dunn to the podcast. Coach Dunn is a longtime college and professional basketball coach, and she currently serves as the special assistant to the head coach for the University of Kentucky's women's basketball team. Coach Dunn is a member of the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame and is known as a pioneer for women's basketball and women's athletics as a whole. She spent over 30 years coaching college basketball and another 11 in the WNBA, where she led the 2012 Indiana Fever to a WNBA championship. She was also an assistant coach for the 1992 USA Women's Olympic team that took third in Barcelona, and she spent a year as the president of the National Women's Basketball Coaches Association. In our conversation today, we talk about wise use of practice time, creating a culture of accountability, modeling vulnerability, defining roles for players and coaches, having hard conversations, and improving our teaching. If you enjoy the episode and want to get a copy of the podcast notes, go to coachesclubpod.com and drop your email in the form to get the notes from this episode or any episode. And as a bonus, I'll email you a link to download my entire library of coaching notes. If you're already on my email list, just check your email inbox for the link to download the notes from this week's episode. And if you want to learn more about being part of the Coaches Club community, a community of like-minded coaches that's committed to learning and growing, go to coachesclub.community to learn more or schedule a call to talk to me about joining. And lastly, don't forget to grab your spot in the third round of book clubs covering the Coach's Guide to Teaching before they're gone. The book clubs are four weeks long and cover Chapter 3 from the Coach's Guide to Teaching, which dives into improving our feedback. You can get a sneak peek into the book clubs in bonus episodes two and three, which also include a guest appearance in Q&A with Doug Lamov. I'm only running one book club this round, and it meets on Sundays at 2 p.m. Central Time. There's only eight spots left, so grab yours before we kick off on October 3rd. To learn more or sign up for the next round, go to cgtbookclubs.com or click the link in the show details. Now to my conversation with Coach Lynn Dunn. Enjoy the episode. All right, coaches, really excited to welcome Coach Lynn Dunn to the podcast today. Uh, Coach Dunn, so appreciate you joining me today. And I would love to start off by talking about wise use of practice time. I know this is something you're really passionate about. And so I'd love if you would share your perspective on maybe some areas that coaches typically get this wrong in terms of using practice time wisely and how we can get better at it. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, You know, I really love your podcast. I look forward to them on Twitter. Can't wait to see what the next one's going to be. So I'm excited to be here. Yes, I am a fanatic about practice. I don't think anything, I can't think of anything that uh, influences your opportunity to be successful more than what you do with your practice time. And let's emphasize that word time, T-I-M-E, so extremely valuable. What are you doing with your time? And are you using your time wisely? Uh, As a consultant, when I watch a a coach practice, you know, I'm always thinking, you know, why did you do that drill? What is the purpose of that drill? What are you trying to accomplish? Because in many instances, I see you wasting time. 
And so I challenge coaches, you know, is your practice is it planned? Is it organized? Is it detailed? Is it timed? You know, are you absolutely sucking everything you can out of every second, not just every minute, but every second? Um, and so, uh, you know, are you are you uh, connecting the drills and the sessions and the stations with your system? You know, is there a connection there? That drill that you did, does it carry over to your offensive system, to your defensive system. So everything has to connect and everything has to have a purpose and you can never, never waste time. And so one of the things that I'll do with coaches is say, I want to know what your three, three, three is. And I don't know where I got this. I don't know who I stole it from, but I want to know the three things you want to be great at. I want to know the three things you want to be good at. And I want to know the three things that you're going to be, you know, average at. And so I better see in your practice time, you better be spending the most amount of time on the three things that you want to be excellent at. You tell me you want to be a running team and that's who you are and that's your identity, then that better be where you're spending your time. So you can constantly use your 333 and go back and say, hey, I'm saying this, but I'm not doing this. And so it kind of gets into that accountability piece. So knowing, knowing your identity, understanding your system and making sure your practice pieces fit into that. Are your drills multiple? Are they competitive? Do they, are they game-like? Do they have decision-making? Do they have all have value? You know, are you just absolutely getting everything you can out of that practice time? And sometimes when I go watch a practice and it goes on for two and three and four hours, I'm like, hey, stop. You've only got one hour. Now, put together a practice plan and show me what you're going to do in that one hour. And that's when I find out what they really value. And then that's when I find out where they get really organized. So that's kind of some thoughts on practice. That's really good. There's a few things in there that I like a lot. I'll just say something about the last thing you just said quickly. That's really powerful. Essentially, what you're doing is having them to figure out what is essential. Like you said, what do you really value? If you only had an hour, what would you do with your team? That's, that's really powerful just to help coaches trim the fat or cut the fluff out of their practice. Cause I think yep. it can be easy as coaches to just default to uh, I've done these drills or seen these drills done. So let's just do them. They'll chew up some time and I can say that they're developing X, Y, and Z. But like you said, if they're not developing those, those core things, the identity of your, of your team. I think it's just largely a waste of time. I do have one follow-up question to something you said at the beginning, though. You talked about maximizing time and having it, having, you know, have your practice really planned out and, and blocks of time, all of that. My question, my follow-up question, that would be, what's the balance between maximizing your time and practice, making sure that it's used wisely and being flexible in the moment to the needs of your athletes. You know, so maybe you're you're going through a game or a drill and the learning that you were focused on in that chunk of time, it's just not happening. Are you going to drop it, move on, or are you going to stay with it until those athletes get it? Do you have any thoughts on that? Absolutely. When I first started out coaching, we were not going to leave that drill until we got it correctly. We were going to get that done right. And then as I matured and as I got more experienced, I realized, boy, what a, what a bad idea that was. You know, so when I got back on track, we'll come back to that tomorrow. We've only got six minutes for this drill. We're going to do the best we can do in that six minutes. And then we're going to move on and we're going to come back tomorrow and then during that period of time, what I'm going to do is figure out why didn't we why didn't we accomplish more? What am I doing that I could do differently to make sure that they pick this up, that they catch it, that they understand it? I'm going to hold myself accountable that obviously whatever I devised, whatever drill I did, whatever teaching tools I used didn't work. It didn't connect. They didn't understand what I was talking about. They didn't pick up the skill I, too advanced. Let's go back. Let's 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 be a little bit more beginning instead of intermediate. And so now I don't do, now I don't do that. And I encourage coaches stay on your schedule, 
when the time's up, move on to the next drill and reevaluate why you why you didn't do better in that drill. But whatever you do, don't throw your whole practice off because of one drill. And that's that's a immature, young, inexperienced coach tends to do that. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I think the thing that just stood out to me the most in what you said is that that drill or game doesn't go well. And your response is not to blame the athletes for it. It's to take a look at yourself first and ask, okay, so what do I need to change? And I think it's just easy for coaches so often to blame the athletes for a lack of focus, a lack of effort, whatever, maybe a lack of blank, right? And neglect to examine, oh, was it something that I did? Was it something in my teaching, something in my leading, something in my practice design that actually was the reason that they didn't get this. Or maybe it's just that they need more reps at it. And, you know, it's new, right? Those things can uh, take time. And so I'd love to just hear a little bit more about your process of reflection, both that you used as a coach and now that you um, help coaches use. How are you helping coaches reflect on their practices or games? What's that process like that you help coaches go through? Well, what you just said is powerful because um, the first person that needs to be held accountable for anything, for for a drill, for uh, scouting, for game planning, for whatever, is the coach. The coach must point the finger um, at themselves first and they must look at, okay, what can I do better? What could I have done better? How could I have taught it? Um, you know, perfect example is you lose by four, but you miss 12 free throws. Instead of yelling at the players about missing free throws, I personally say, hey, guys, my bad. We're not we're not spending enough time on free throws. I, I promise you every day before we leave practice, everybody will hit 10 free throws and that'll take care of that problem. That's my responsibility to make sure we're investing in the areas that help us win. So reflecting, holding accountable myself first, my coaches our teaching tools, our methods is huge. And so if I do that, if I set that example, then now the players know it's okay for them to admit their mistakes. It's okay for them to hold each other accountable, but I have to be the model. I have to set the tone of this is how we, um, you know, this is how we handle situations by holding ourselves accountable first. And I think that's really important. I also think post-practice is really a great time. Some, some coaches uh, write notes during practice as they go along. Some coaches go back and watch the film. Um, some coaches have the, the luxury of having a special assistant who's watching the practice and sending them notes. But anytime you can revisit what you just did and say, okay, if I, I wish I'd have done this a little bit better. I should have done that a little bit better. So you're always striving to get better. Yeah, that's really good there's so many good things in there. And like you just talked about that. Yeah. Having someone else watch your practice, I think can be really powerful. And, and then just wa- going back and watching it yourself and, and realizing too, that it, it starts with us. So yeah. And, and what you said is so powerful because it, it continues to build trust with your team too, when they see that you're, you are willing to change and grow and reflect. And it's not just, uh, a game of blaming them for the team's failures, but that you're invested in the process too, and recognize that you have room for growth. And you mentioned it kind of throughout that answer. You started to talk about accountability and that it starts at the top. I'd love for you to talk more about that. Why is it so important? And, and how can coaches create a culture of accountability while still creating and fostering positive, healthy relationships with their team? Well, you know, you, you, you use the word culture, you know, let's, let's be honest here. You know, accountability is a huge piece of culture. It's a huge piece of a behavior that you want all of your uh, people that are involved in your program to embrace. You know, we're going to hold ourselves accountable in everything that we do. We're going to hold our teammates accountable. And so when you model that, when you set that example, you send a message, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to admit you made a mistake. It's okay to accept responsibility. And as the leader, when you do that, now that behavior is reinforced with everyone. So it's huge. And 
I, I can't think of anything other, well, I just really can't think of anything that, that helps build trust and helps build that connection more than holding yourself accountable and being vulnerable with each other. I'm going to let my guard down and say, yeah, I made a mistake. I messed up. It's my bad, my fault. You know, I know I can do better. You know, is there anything else anybody thinks they can do better, you know, to make our team better? And so we share that moment with each other. And so coaches that are always pointing the finger at someone else, that's not going to work. It's just not, it's, it's, it's kind of fear-based. And, and you, you know, you don't want to be fear-based. You want to, you're going to make mistakes, you know, own them, learn from them, get better from them. So um, if you want to build a connection, if you really want to develop a strong relationship, um, then be honest and, 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 you know, be open. Yeah, I messed up. I screwed up. It's my bad. My fault. Yeah, we're going to get better. I'm going to do that better. You know, I, that drill, I don't know why I did that drill, y'all. That was just, sorry, mistake, my bad. Let's move on. I'll do better tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's really good. And I'm really curious and, and you may not have a specific one, but I'd love to know, are, are, is there a, maybe a story or example of that from, your own coaching journey. I mean, you, you coached a lot of levels, coached some high level players. Uh, any story that comes to mind from your coaching journey of a time when you had to be really vulnerable or hold yourself accountable and maybe how that impacted your team? Well, I think anytime you have a tough loss, you know, that that's where you're really challenged. Uh, and you can look back in your career. And I think early on, immature, young, inexperienced coaches, you know, they tend to, to lose their poise and composure. They tend to be angry. They tend to be frustrated. And they tend, tend to look outside themselves first. Uh, uh, you know, I think whenever there's a tough loss, one of the first things that you have to do, um, and, and I can think of tough, close losses where I, I made a mistake. Maybe the, the last second play, I didn't use a timeout, or, I, you know, I set up the play incorrectly you know I know I made a mistake I know I messed up you know so being able to own that is so powerful and uh um and 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 so it's okay to do that that that's what I want to reinforce to coaches hey that's a positive you know your best coaches your your best pro coaches you know your best college coaches that are experienced and consistently successful they own their mistakes you know they're 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 experienced enough and confident enough to know, hey, this is a plus, not a minus. And so I can't think of a particular, I mean, there have been plenty of them, you know, in, in, in 50 years, but just being consistent with that, you know, just being consistent with accepting responsibility. That's, it's my responsibility to make you better. It's my responsibility to explain to you what we need to do better and how we need to do it. So you just own it. Yeah, that's really good. One of the things that just stood out to me, and I'd, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on it. You just mentioned that, you know, the coaches at the highest level that are really successful, they do this. And I think you said something to the effect of they are confident or, you know, the word that was going through my mind is they're kind of secure in their identity too, as a coach that they aren't letting, letting who they are be so tied to the outcome of a game that they maybe act in ways that are out of character. And I think that's hard for coaches, especially because we're in a profession that is driven by results and, and judged based on a win loss record oftentimes. And so do you have any thoughts on maybe how coaches can, yeah, stay secure in their identity, not let their identity just become attached to a win loss record or the performance of their team? Well, I think your, your, your best coaches, and when I say your best coaches, you're consistently successful coaches at any level. You know, there's some attributes that they all have. You know, they've invested an enormous amount of time in growing their knowledge of the game. They have tremendous knowledge of the game. They have great teaching skills. They're adaptable. They're flexible. You know, they've surrounded themselves with a great staff. And that we could talk about that for a whole hour on how important your staff is. You know, they put people in place that make them better, that challenge them. Um, you know, so there are a lot of reasons why they have become successful and stayed successful. But, but I think that they're, they're wise enough, you know, to, to, to understand 
that I have to accept responsibility for this team. You know, I have to own the wins. Uh, and when, when we win, I point the finger at the players. I point the finger at the player that hit the free throw, that got the great rebound, that dove on the floor. When we lose, I point the finger at myself. I own the losses. You own the wins. And I think great coaches understand that. that they, they get it. Um, and so that is a strong bond between the team because they know after a tough loss, coach is going to own it. Coach is going to carry that burden. After a great win, coach is going to point at us and give us that, give us that praise and, and, and give, us, give us the win. You get the wins, I get the losses. And so as a coach, if you can understand that, boy, you're well on your way. Yeah, absolutely. That's really good. You started to talk about coaching staffs, and that was one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit. I'd love to hear your thoughts and experience with the importance of the coaches on your coaching staff really knowing their role. Well, first of all, let me, let me say this about coaching staffs. Um, I When I consult with teams and I go and watch, I can tell if a team is going to struggle or if a coach is going to struggle based on the strength of his or her staff. If you've got a weak staff, staff, you're going to struggle. And so one of the first things I may say is you need to make some changes in your staff. Your staff's not strong enough. They're not good enough. And so I don't know why you've hired that one, that one, that one. I'm not sure what they bring to the table. But if you don't do something about your staff, you're going to get fired. And so that's – I'm the truth teller. So I tell them that. And sometimes I go in and I see staffs. Oh, wow, I love this one. I, love, I see what that one does. Man, I see the – the, the delegation over here. So it's obvious to me that you've surrounded yourself with great people that bring something to the table, that challenge you, that make you better. That when you say, okay, we're going to, we're going to ice everything. And they say, why coach, why are we icing everything? Why, explain to me why you want to do that. I want somebody to challenge me. I want somebody to make me think I may, I want to go away from a practice planning meeting thinking, Hmm, Maybe that wasn't a good idea. Maybe I need to rethink that instead of everybody saying, great, great, yes, yes. No, I don't want a staff like that. So it's important as the head coach that you decide the roles of each one on your staff. Empower them, give them ownership, give them responsibility, evaluate them, give them feedback. And if they're in the wrong role, just like if somebody's on the bus that's the wrong bus, you got to get them off the bus. Maybe they're on the right bus, but they're in the wrong seat. I may have to reassign some things like that. And I have to always be aware of growth. You know, I want professional growth in my staff. Do I need to send uh, one of my assistants, uh, you know, to Doc Rivers training camp? Or do I need to send one of my assistants, you know, over to Mike Neighbors uh, practices, you know, to pick up some three-point shooting drills? You know, I have to be aware of where they're weak and how I can help them get better. But roles, golly, Bill. You know, why do people not want to talk about roles, especially with players? I can't even imagine the player not knowing their role. I mean, like, let's say somebody gets a quick foul and four people stand up down there on the end of the beach because they all think they're going in because nobody knows their role. So you have to have the difficult conversations. You have to say, okay, here's your role. Here's what you can expect. Here's your role. Here's what you can expect. And by the way, Nancy, you probably won't get any play in time unless there's an injury or a foul, a foul problem. But you have to stay ready. You have to be a great practice player, and you have to stay ready because if somebody gets hurt or we get in foul trouble, your role can change. But you, she knows her role. It's, there's not a, it's not a wonder. It's, it's, can you accept that role? Are you going to be okay with it? Do you understand how valuable you are? Because you're ready. You're doing what somebody else doesn't want to do the backups, the subs, their role is immense because they're your, your, your chemistry on the bench. So you have to be clear about the roles and you have to have the difficult conversations. Yeah, that's really good. There's a lot of good things in there for coaches. You've mentioned a couple of times, talk to me some more about the difficult conversations and what did you find in your coaching journey or maybe some keys to succeeding in those difficult conversations. I know succeeding maybe is a, is a weird word to ascribe to it, but how, how do you have those difficult conversations well? How about, how about surviving? surviving? Yeah, sometimes. Conversations. Well, um, you, you don't think, again, early on in my career, 
I tended to avoid them because I didn't, you know, I wasn't sure how to handle them. I wasn't sure how to deal with them. And so you, you just, you, you tend to avoid uh, difficult, challenging conversations. And then that just leads to more problems. And so, um, you know, I don't want to be a problem solver. I want to be a problem preventer. I want to prevent problems if I can. Um, and so that that when I learned how important that was, I think that really helped. Um, you know, one of the one of the uh, difficult conversations is is a uh, uh, everybody doesn't have the green light to take any shot they want. Are you kidding me? I can't think of a way. Uh, or path that's going to get you beat, then everybody's got the green light. When I hear a coach say that, I'm like, are you, are you serious? That's a joke, isn't it? And, and so the, 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 the conversation about what is your shot and what is a good shot for you and how your shot helps our team is really, really important. Being clear about, okay, now, Jenny is going to get maybe 18 shots a game. Uh, everybody's not going to get 18 shots. She's our go-to player. We're going to run some plays for her or him. And so that's clear. It's not under, it's, it's not a misunderstanding there. It's a clear, uh, this is not an equal opportunity situation. Now, maybe if you're doing the third graders, you know, and y'all are playing and, you you know, it's a different mentality. But you have to be clear about what is a good shot and when that shot should be taken um, I had a player once that she was very frustrated because she, I didn't let her shoot much and, and, and she really struggled. And so finally I said, look, you've got the green light to take any shot you want as long as you can touch the net. And she looked at me and she said, touch the net. I said, yeah, anytime, anywhere, anywhere that you are, that you can touch the net and you can take any shot. Well, coach, that's limits me to my shot. I said, it limits you to your shot. She wasn't happy, but she was clear about what I considered her shot, her shot that was going to help us win. So a little bit of humor helps. Yeah, absolutely. And I think <laughs> the most important thread throughout both of those things is just that there's clarity that the person in charge gets really clear with the players that they're leading and the staff that they're leading about how how that person can best contribute to the team's success because if you're not like you said you're actually i think you're actually going to have to have more hard conversations or you'll avoid them and the culture of your team will suffer greatly for it if you don't have hard conversations in front like you talked about if you don't prevent the problem the problems will absolutely find you because yeah, you weren't intentional about having those conversations. So I think that's just such a huge takeaway for coaches is that we've got to prevent the problems by having the conversations that are uncomfortable before, <laughs> before they become problems. And I would, I would uh, say that if you're not having some uncomfortable conversations, then you're avoiding situations. Every coach, every year, has uncomfortable conversations. That's part of your job. Just, just like a parent has uncomfortable conversations with their children. That's part of the, 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 the responsibility of being a coach or of being a parent. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Kind of shifting lanes a little bit. And we talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but I would love to just get your thoughts on a few ways that coaches can become better teachers. We talked about it off air. Unfortunately, most coaches, not most, some coaches don't have a background in education. Uh, many coaches don't know what they don't know when it comes to teaching and learning. And so maybe what are some practical tools, some strategies that you used in your coaching or you help coaches use when you consult with them now to help them improve their teaching? Well, fortunately for me, um, and, and this is a great area, Luke, I, I think this is something that really needs to be discussed is how do we become better teachers and how do we become better coaches? Uh, for me, I was an education major and I, I don't think I realized at the time how tremendously valuable that was. I, I student taught. I had to put together lesson plans. I had to do beginning, intermediate, advanced skills. I had to do a six-week program. And so I understood 
how to teach those things. I understand whole part whole. I understand, um, you know, that I've got one minute to, to explain and I've got five minutes to drill. You know, I understand all of that because I was taught that. And so if you are not an education major and you don't have that background in how to teach, then you have to invest in that area. And there's a lot of ways you can do that. One of the ways is their books. Uh, you know, they're, the two of my favorite books are um, Perfect Practice and um, what is it? The Coach's Guide to, to Coach's Guide to Teaching. Teaching. Yeah, Doug Lamov's books. Both of them are by uh, Doug Lamov, and they're excellent. And when I um, when I work with coaches, right off the bat, I say I want you to read these two books. We're going to talk about them. Uh, we'll talk about the different chapters. They're going to help you become a better teacher. And once you become a better teacher then you will become a better coach. Um, the other way you can really improve is with podcasts, um, with clinics. Um, I, I encourage coaches, go to as many practices as you can. One of the great things for me as a professional coach, when I coached in the pros, I could go to everybody's college coach. And so if I went on the Duke campus to watch the Duke women, I went and watched the Duke men. You know, so I, I had so many opportunities to watch other people's practices and I copied them. I walked, copied them. How did they do that? How did they teach that? And I was always watching um, ways to become a better teacher. And, and so I invested in that area. You know, how can I be a better coach? How can I be a better teacher? Um, and then if I, if I get better, then I can teach my assistants how to be better. You know, so it was a constant thing that I thought had tremendous value. And so, you know, when you're when you're through learning, you're through. So you're constantly looking to see, OK, what are the best programs doing? You know, what are the Warriors doing? You know, what, what are what are the how did the Milwaukee Bucks? What are the how all of a sudden are they the team to beat now? And and then I saw what Nate McMillan has done over there in Atlanta in a short period of time. I'm curious about what they're doing. And so I'm going to invest my time into looking at studying the best. I've watched Geno's practices. I've watched Pat Summit's practices, Krzyzewski's. Uh, Hubie Brown is one of my all-time favorite mentors. I sat through two weeks of his training camp when he coached the Memphis Grizzlies. It was, oh, my God, it was fantastic. I learned so much in that two week period about teaching and coaching and just the whole process of building a team. So make a list of all the ways you can get better and just do it. Yeah, that's good. So powerful to watch other coaches too, to just learn. And yeah, there's, there's few things I think that can replace just observing uh, a peer and coaching. And like you said, taking things that you learned from there and applying it to your own coaching, applying it to your team. One of the things that you mentioned at the beginning of your answer that I thought was a really yeah, powerful little thing that you said was you said, hey, you've got one minute to explain the drill and five minutes to rep the drill. And I think that coaches can be notorious for over talking in practice. We take a really long time to explain something. And then we had seven minutes or six minutes for this drill, but players only spend one or two minutes actually doing it because we talked for the other four or five minutes. If you're working with a coach and they have that issue, how are you helping solve? How are you helping them solve it? Well, once again, you're going to have to have maybe an uncomfortable conversation because if whatever they're doing they're under the assumption that they're doing it the best way, you know, so I have to give them the benefit of the doubt. But if I see that they're wasting time, it's back to our time thing. You know, am I maximizing the small amount of time that I have? Am I getting everything out of it that I can? And if they're not, then I have to explain to them why they're not. One, you're talking too much. You need to talk in bullets. You've got one minute to explain the drill and then drill it. Um, where we get into a little bit of trouble is we try to go too fast. We try to move forward to the next stage instead of rep repetitions, repetitions, repeat, review, repeat, review, move forward, move forward, repeat, review. 
And so we need to slow down and we need to take that drill. And this is a this is a real thing for me. You don't need a million drills. Quit coming up with a I, I am no. You know, I like to say to a coach, okay, now when you go to heaven, you can only take three drills because that's all you they'll let you in with. So what are you going to take? And you better take the three drills that are going to make you the best possible team you can have. And so now the coach starts thinking about, oh, what are my three best drills? And then once I get them to see that, then I say, okay, now how can you tweak those three drills? They're really the same drill, but you've tweaked them. And now you've turned those three drills into six drills. But it's the same drill. And so you don't waste time with the new drill to explain it where they got now. We're doing this drill and today we're doing this to it. And so I've maximized my time. I'm getting all I can get out of it. I know it has value because I'm taking it to heaven with me. <laughs> yes. No, that's so good. And from a teaching and learning perspective too, not only is it so powerful because it increases time on task, but literally what's happening in our athletes' brains is that their working memory, their capacity to take in new information is significantly higher when they don't have to learn a new drill or game. When we teach a new drill or new game, their mind is focused on learning the game. How do I rotate? Where do I go? What are the rules? But if we just have a few drills or structures that we teach out of, they're no longer focused on learning the game. They're focused on the new learning. So maybe your new learning is how you're going to defend ball screens or how you're going to attack ball screens. Well, if you're just teaching out of a structure that they already know, it's much easier for their mind to focus on this new learning, right? So now I'm not worrying about how do I rotate and where do I go? And am I going to mess up the drill? And will coach get mad at me? They know the game. They know the drill. And like you said, now I can just tweak it. Now I can add or layer in new learning. I can go back and review different things. That is such an important takeaway for coaches is that we should actually narrow down the drills or games that we use in practice and figure out how we can adjust them to learning, right? And gosh, Absolutely. like you said too, it's time, right? It just saves so much time. You want to talk about faster transitions to in practice, all of those things. When you can just say, Hey, we're doing this game or this drill and athletes know it and can get right into it. And then you can just pause them and say, okay, now we're doing, we're focusing on this out of this, or now I'm changing this one rule of the game. Athletes love it too, right? Because now we're not wasting time learning new things that they don't see the point of. And yeah, it can totally just change your practice. And I think the learning of your athletes, if you embrace that. Well, that's one of the reasons why I like cutthroat so much. You know, uh, once you've instilled or installed cutthroat, uh, that drill, and then you may say, okay, today we're doing cutthroat, but you have to set an on-ball screen before you can shoot. You know, so we've added on-ball screening to our cutthroat drill. So we have, it's, so I've taken that one drill that's competitive, it's game-like, you know, it's intense. Uh, you know, I may, I may give extra points for taking a charge, but I, I, I tweak that that drill daily to work on the piece that I want to, instead of putting in a new drill. Yeah, absolutely. And there's coaches that listen to this podcast that are not basketball coaches. I know we're both basketball coaches. So for a coach, that's not a basketball coach, tell them really quickly what, what cutthroat is and why you like it. And maybe they can figure out how they could adapt it to their sport. Well, it's just modified uh, a game, actually. And, um, you know, it's you can do it three on three or four on four. Um, and so you stay on one end of the court and offense, defense. And maybe you have three or four teams. And if you score, you stay on, you get the ball, you kick it back to the coach, and you get it back again, and a new team comes on, a new defensive team comes on. And so it's a constant rotation there where you have to pay attention uh, but you're not running full court, but it's half court and it's competitive and you can tweak how you want to to, um, uh, to run it. And you can also give points. What I like to do is really take it up a notch by saying, OK, if you take a charge, you get two extra points. If you get an offensive rebound, you get an extra point. So the point of emphasis is offensive rebounding. You know, if you keep somebody from driving into your middle because you play denied defense and you don't you force baseline, if you stop somebody in the middle, give her a point. You know, so you can emphasize points 
for things that you value that particular day. Um, it can be very intense. It can be very competitive. Um, lots of talking. It's a great way for the assistants to watch on the sideline about some of the things that maybe they're not watching the ball on defense or they're not moving on the pass. So you can make some corrections defensively. Um, and, and, and in particular, if you don't want to run full court, you know, if you want to save their legs, I, we use it a lot in the pros because we have to save their legs. They're older. We can't run full court for, you know, an hour and a half every day. We have to find ways to, to drill and to work uh, while we're saving their legs. But yet at the same time, it, it has to be game life. And so that's, uh, uh, you can probably go on YouTube and, and type in cutthroat and there it comes. It's, you'll see all, everybody doing their, va- their variation of cutthroat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I love, love to use variations of that too. And I love what you said there about adjusting the scoring. I just think that more coaches should do that. Like we're talking about, you know, you have a game or a structure and then just adjust the scoring of it. You know, for example, uh, the, the teams that I coach, we put a, a premium on finishing off of two feet around the rim in basketball. And so oftentimes I'll just adjust the scoring. Hey, any two foot finish around the rim is worth you know this amount of points. And so essentially what it's doing is it's encouraging them to use the skills that we want to in the context of a game, which is what we have to have to do in practice if we want them to actually do it in the game when it matters the most. So yeah, I think that's a huge takeaway too, is figure out how in the games you play, the drills you do, you can adjust the scoring to emphasize what you want to emphasize and to help them get more reps at the skills they need to succeed in the game. Because oftentimes, you know, athletes don't want to try something new because they might not be very good at it yet. But when you adjust the scoring to something, they're much more likely to take a risk and practice and try something, even if they're not great at it yet, because that's how they'll get better by trying it, Mm -hmm. by trying it in context too. And so I think that's just a really, really powerful tool for coaches. Hey, just adjust the scoring. What do you want to emphasize? What do you want to reinforce and make that worth more points in the game that you're playing? And obviously that means that you're playing competitive games too, which that could be a whole nother side tangent of make sure that you're competing in your practices. But yeah, yeah, I think that's loser. Yeah. Yeah. Winners and losers. That's how the game is. Yeah. Well, the other thing too is um, change the time on the clock. You know, it's not always the uh, uh, same time. So, so they have to watch the clock. You know, they get in the habit of watching the clock, you know, do I have 10 seconds? Do I have four seconds? Do I have 12 seconds? So there you, 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 you have a, uh, struggle sometimes with hey you didn't you didn't pay attention to the clock you didn't pay attention to the shot clock so change the time sometimes and remember this about cutthroat it's not pattern it's not a set offense and so now there's a lot more decision making you know there's a lot more um, opportunities for players to make a play and so I think cutthroat really helps you learn how to play instead of learn how to run a play and I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's really good too. time. That's another great constraint to change just to put athletes in different situations. Like you talked about, uh, well, coach Dunn, I have one more question for you and then I've got some rapid fire questions. Oh dear. Here, here's my, <laughs> here's my question for you. Okay. If you could decide these are the top three things that every coach of every sport, every level they need to be educated on these things or know how to do these things in their coaching, what would they be? Ooh. Well, I think they know how to, they, they need to know how to teach. I mean, they have to know how to teach. Um, they have to understand the value of a connection of a relationship. So know how to teach, uh, know how to connect with their players, because once you have a connection and build a relationship, that's how you motivate players. You motivate through, relationships. Um, and then I think um, the other thing that I, I think a coach needs to figure out is how to stay balanced. You know what I'm saying? How, how to stay balanced. Um, you know, basketball is what you do. It's not who you are. And, and so you, you have to invest in your, in your career, but you also have to invest in your family and in your friends and so I think you're going to be a better coach if you're balanced. So learn how to stay balanced, um, understand the value of a connection, and that you're constantly working on that connection. You're constantly working on those relationships. Invest as much in relationships 
as you do in those out of bounds plays, as you do in that uh, uh, transition early offense. So are, think about the investment that you're making in your technical side. Are you making it on your uh, relationship side? And then learn how to teach, learn how to maximize that practice time. That'd, that'd be the three things I'd say. That's really good. That's a great list. And I love that you just said connecting with players. That's how you motivate them. I think it's easy to forget that, you know, we can as coaches maybe look for a quick fix for motivation, but really the motivation comes from the relationship and the connection that players feel that they have with us and them knowing that we, we believe in them, that we care about them and that we're there to help them improve from the first, from the first kid in your rotation to the last kid in your rotation that you're invested in their improvement regardless of how big or small their contribution may be. I think that's just so huge. Such a powerful reminder. Everyone has value. Everyone has value and everyone has to feel like they have value. And you as the coach, you have to find a way to make that last person on the bench feel value because that matters. Hmm. That's so, that's so, so powerful. I'd also love for you to just say a little bit more about staying balance. You said, you know, coaching is what you do. It's not who you are. How did you find some balance in your life and your coaching journey? Well, I was unbalanced. You know, I think a lot of times when you first start out again, you tend to get a little bit out of whack. You tend to be spending 24 seven, um, you know, trying to win, trying to be better, trying to recruiting It's 24 seven. Um, and then you, you know, you, you burn the candle at both ends, you're worn out and you realize that less is better. Okay. I just need to do less, um, and, and do that better and understand that how am I going to recharge my battery? I'm going to recharge my battery by staying invested in my health, in my family, in my friends. You know, I look back, if I had a do over, if I had a mulligan, uh, I would have spent a lot more time uh, with my mother in the last years of her life. You know, I should have invested more time in in being with her instead of being, I don't know where I was in a foreign country looking to try to sign a foreign player. You know what I'm saying? It 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 was it was uh, a mistake on my part that I did that I got out of balance. And I realized that later in life. And so I encourage coaches. Now to constantly ask themselves, you know, am I staying in balance? You know, do I have one uh, time, one night a week where I'm spending it only with my family or may it's two nights a week or, you know, what am I doing on Sundays when that's everybody's day off on the day off? Am I really taking my day off? You know, so, uh, you know, if you want to recharge your battery and if you want to realize that you're not always going to coach basketball, there's going to come a day when you retire and you may turn around to spend time with family and friends and there's nobody there because you've, you know, you let them go while you were so busy trying to, um, you know, create a last second play that might win you another game. Are you, you know, you got a lot of trophies, but, you know, do you sleep with trophies? You know, do you hug trophies? No. So you better be careful what you invest most of your time in. That's really powerful. Thanks for sharing that. Appreciate your honesty too. And just that the reality is you felt like, yeah, you, you messed up on that. And, and that was something you had to learn the hard way. And so, yeah, so that's a regret I have. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Well, here's a, a few rapid fire questions after you would love to just know the first thing that comes to your mind. The first one I have <laughs> is, is this the most fun part of coaching is. Oh, wow. I, I, I think it's the relationships. It's the the laughter, the fun. I still, you know, I still have photos. I look back at some of my favorite players through the years, and and I don't I don't think about the games. I think about you know the night we played charades or the Halloween uh, costume parties where we dressed up, or you, you know, so the laughter and the fun that we had together. That 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 that's going to always stick in my mind. That's fantastic. Here's the next one. And we've talked about some of these things throughout the interview and maybe it's what you just mentioned, but what's maybe, yeah, the number one thing you've got to decide here for this one. I wish I would have known blank before my first coaching experience. 
I wish I'd understood accountability more. I wish I'd understood the value of accountability and culture and understanding that culture is really a foundation of your program and, and, and how important those behavior skills are and those connections. You know, I was really too focused on trying to figure out how to win a ball game, you know, the, the, the technical side. And so I didn't really understand the value of that connection side. Uh, and how important that was. I wish I, I wish I'd understood that better. That's really good. Here's my last one. I know I'm successful as a coach when. When you, someone like you asked me to be on a podcast. <laughs> I don't know if that's a great barometer of it, but I appreciate you saying that. Oh, well, you know, I, I think, it depends on how you define success. You, you know, that, that's the key thing. How do you define success? You know, uh, is, it, is it wins and losses? Is it championships? Is it a trophy? Um, or is it seeing some of your athletes accomplish things that you never thought they would accomplish? They got those degrees. You know, they're, they're now a CEO of a corporation. You know, so the, the key thing is, how do you define success? And, and, and I think it's, for me now at this particular time, it's just seeing my former players be successful in whatever they've decided to do. And that, that, that sports and basketball and competition was a path for them to be where they are today, you know, and to be successful in whatever they've decided to do. That's really good. Such a good, important question for coaches to consider. How do I define success? Yeah, I think we all need to be really clear on that in our coaching journey. Coach Dunn, this has been awesome. Super appreciate you taking time to talk with me today. Uh, before we hop off, do you just want to share how coaches can connect with you? Well, I'm on Twitter. I'm UK Chalk Talk. Um, I, love, I love to communicate there. Um, uh, that, that's probably the best way to ask me questions or, you know, send me plays or, or whatever. It's at UK Chalk Talk on Twitter. Perfect. I'll make sure to put that in the show details so coaches can connect with you there. Yeah, Coach Dunn, thanks again. Really appreciate you joining me. You're welcome. It was great fun. Have a great day. Coaches, thanks for listening to this episode, and thanks again to Coach Dunn for coming on to the podcast. I really appreciate how much she emphasized that it all starts with us as the leader. If we want our athletes to own their mistakes, become reflective, and learn from them, we have to be willing to model that in our coaching. And I don't think it can be understated how important what she shared around role definition for coaches and players is. With the disclaimer that we really are talking about more competitive levels here, not necessarily youth sports. It can be really uncomfortable, like she mentioned, but it's part of our responsibility to clearly define roles for our players and coaches. If we avoid those tough conversations, they won't just go away. It will come back to haunt us in the form of our culture being sabotaged or a bunch of other conversations that could have been prevented if we were willing to initiate and have the uncomfortable conversations at the beginning. So that's my encouragement to you on the leadership side. Have the hard conversations. It's worth it. Tell your players the truth and do it in a way that is caring and communicates our belief in them. And do the same with your coaches. And one final thought on the teaching side maximize reps and time on task. Like Coach Dunn talked about, we've got to explain things quickly so we can get them active more. I'm a huge fan of what she shared about eliminating drills. Selecting only a handful of drills or games that you use in your practice can be a game changer when it comes to increasing time on task and the number of reps your athletes are getting. And like we talked about, when athletes aren't focused on learning a new drill or game, they can actually focus their attention on learning the skill or concept. So that's my encouragement to you on the teaching side. Eliminate drills. Only select a handful of drills or games that you're going to teach from. Teach those drills to your athletes, then adjust them and modify them as you need to learn those things that you need them to learn. Like I mentioned in the intro, you can hop on my email list and get the podcast notes from this episode at coachesclubpod.com. And if you're interested in being part of the Coaches Club community, go to coachesclub.community or click the link in the show details. And finally, don't forget to sign up for the next round of book clubs covering the Coach's Guide to Teaching. We kick off on October 3rd, and there's only eight spots left. Go to cgtbookclubs.com to learn more or sign up. 
Thanks for listening to the Coaches Club podcast powered by Transform Sport, where we believe great coaches transform lives, athletes deserve great coaches, and coaches deserve great training.